We show who cut content with Mr. Annie News. This is called Rudius's Reunion with Paul and Roxy. Plus, why the labyrinth is so dangerous. Give it to me. Two heartfelt reunions captivated us throughout this episode, but in between all that were the finer details defining this brand new adventure. Okay. I'm talking the labyrinth, its monsters, and the way Paul and his party approached them, all the way to the city of Rapan and how it became like this. They're the enriching elements of Mushoku Tensei's lore that further brings to life an already well-developed story. So, while I will go deeper into how exactly Rudy's reunions went, there's quite a bit more to be said about the world around him too. I hope, thank you for the gift of tier 1 sub 114, but I hope that Annie News talks about Tallhand and how he was looking at, you know, Rudy's, you know. Specifically the labyrinth, the danger within, and the party Rudy will be challenging it with. The danger within might be fucking Tallham, bro. Someone fucking arrest this guy. Before I get started though, there's- Ah, he got me early with the ad read. Before we get started, I was too focused on making Tallhand jokes, but back to regular cut content. Episode 44, Into the Labyrinth, covering chapters 1 to 4 from volume 12 of the light novel. To start things off with a bit of lore, Rapan wasn't always the most prominent city in Begarit. Before it was just a small oasis, but after a chain reaction of events, it had become this bustling hub for fame-seeking adventurers. I want to know this bone structure. People are saying like this is like a huge behemoth or something, but like what is this? What particular series of events caused it to take off then? Well, it all stems back to how these massive bones got here. Yeah! You see, this was once a behemoth causing havoc in the area, up until the North God Kalman came and defeated it. North God Kalman. Uh, North God sounds like sword related. Sometimes I get confused on like different titles and ranks, but North God, this is North Sword style God uh, sword user, right? I know I said no person had ever witnessed one being slain before, but for a powerful warrior who's defeated an immortal demon king and dragons alike, a simple behemoth was probably nothing for him. Really? Kalman. Kalman defeated an immortal demon king. How do you defeat an immortal being? You seal it? I don't know. Demon king and dragons alike. Jesus Christ. Was probably nothing for him. So. Kalman came, feasted on the behemoth, then left, and what was left behind was nothing but a rotting carcass. One that would eventually attract all sorts of monsters. Okay. Of those, ants were a good number of the monsters that had come to feast too, and it was their tunnels that would create the numerous labyrinths surrounding Rapan. The ants didn't create the tunnels, did they? Like, the ants were the most dangerous monsters any news said last episode, crossing the desert. Were they the same ants? They had come in droves to take part in what S was essentially free Solo food, leveling and ants. created nests nearby so that they could continue to take part. The thing about monsters eating the flesh of other stronger monsters, though, is that the resulting offspring will usually be mutated. Mutate? Oh. So these ants who had an endless supply of food from the strongest monster in the desert were now giving birth to mutated kin who would also eat the behemoth flesh. Wait, th th this is some, like, Hunter x Hunter shit, right? Because people keep making the comparison of, like, um... Uh, solo leveling, you know, Jeju Island Ant was basically HXH, you know, they had like a Chimera Ant arc or something, and this is probably that depiction? Man, ants are like the most scariest beings in anime for some reason. Continue this cycle for a few more generations, Jesus. and the expansive nests which now spread across the area as the labyrinths we see today, also became home to powerful mutated offspring. It was the number one- The- I thought the teleportations was why it was so dangerous, but it definitely adds to it. But these monsters, essentially, it's a mutation that keeps making them stronger and stronger. We need to stop letting these goddamn monsters from breeding, bro. Well, it's because they ate, right? They're not breeding with other species. They just, like, eat more of other monsters, and somehow their genetics just start adapting and mutating and become stronger and stronger. ...an attraction for adventurers across the world. Each labyrinth was a potential treasure trove of riches, and the fact there were so many meant adventurers could tackle multiple. It was the perfect place to either get rich quick or come face to face with tragedy. Now, Rudy wasn't so sure that the monster meat theory was true or not, but it did make sense with regards to the demon continent. You see, there monster meat was the only thing to eat, and it just so happened that a higher rate of strong people were born there. Aww. This made Rudy wonder if his child would- 
I thought the it wasn't the food, but like the environment that made them survive. Like the desert, demon continent, very rough to survive, right? It's not our very uh, thriving land. It's extremely arid, you know, irrigation, ir irrigation, you know, um, farmland, stuff like that. Very scary. So I thought because you're from such a rough terrain, there is no other choice but to survive and become stronger like that. But it's like the food, the monster meat. That's what's actually doing all the work? It turned out freakishly strong because of that since he himself had eaten so much monster meat when he was traveling there. Wait... In any case, a short walk would bring Rudy and Alina Lise to the guild and it was here that he would find Geese struggling to find help to save Roxy. The guy he was talking to was supposedly some really strong adventurer, but oh, really? no matter what Geese offered, it wasn't enough to face the certain death which came with traversing the teleportation labyrinth. Even the strongest people in here don't want any of the teleportation labyrinth. It is S rank, by the way. So it's like, yeah, I mean, unless they have something to prove, I probably wouldn't want to risk my life. I'd probably just farm like A rank dungeons and below and just kind of keep it safe, even if I'm OP. He had made comments about it already being a month, which was the first hint Geese wasn't referring to Zenith. Geese was still adamant Roxy. about at least finding Roxy's remains, but once again, Budget Otar said no. <laughs> Budget Otar. This is Danmachi guy, right? This is uh Freya's one of no, it's it's one of Freya's guys, right? Am I wrong? Who is this guy? I swear to God, this guy's from Danmachi. The reason I'm reiterating such a point is because the desperate expressions Geese was making was far different from the ones that Rudy was familiar with. Rudy didn't even know that such a face was possible for him, but according to Alina Lise, that was actually more his standard look. It seemed whatever time Rudy spent with him back in the forest was actually just Geese trying to act more mature for him. Okay, he was basically putting up a cool front in front of the young boss, but actually he's always panicking. Geese would then bring Rudy to Paul, and what Rudy was expecting was a Paul similar to how he was back in Millis. This time a was better. A man frustrated to no end, running away from his pro- Oh, right! Right! The, 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 remember this girl? Yo. Remember that girl in the bikini armor? And I'm like, the fuck does she have a bikini armor for her, Paul? What are you doing, bro? But I forget the exact reasoning, but it was important. I think she was doing this to say somebody, right? She was, ah, oh, fuck. What was the exact reason why she was wearing the bikini armor? It was like an actually important reason. Maybe something about saving sister. I forget, but I remember seeing that a lot. What in the fuck is going on? So the sister didn't take mass. Okay, so she was basically acting as a literal meat shield. Straighted to no end, running away from his problems via bottles of alcohol. What Cups. he saw was instead a person far more tame, but deep in Paul's eyes was nothing but emptiness. He was this hollow shell in which all emotion was absent. Depression sure, arc. he was going through the motions and asking Rudy how he was doing, but the way he did just seemed lifeless. It was a pitiful display that made the entire journey worth it already. Even if Paul's spirit was broken for good, Rudy was going to do everything he could to make things better. He truly believed that he could fix everything. It was as soon I as hope Rudy so. had mentioned his child though that life immediately returned back to Paul's eyes. For a second, and that life is gonna go immediately because this is a fucking death flag. My god, were there flags last episode. I mean, we've been tripping flags like crazy for over the last couple episodes. Clearly a family death is going to happen. Paul is looking like a prime fucking candidate if you ask me. Paul, Zenith, I don't think Roxy will die. Roxy most likely won't die because like we just saved her. It just doesn't make sense to do that. Paul, Zenith, maybe Erin Arize. I don't think Tallhand would die. I don't really know much about him. There wouldn't be an emotional impact. If he did die, I wouldn't really care too much because, like, do we really know much about him? Geese, again, I don't know. But, like, if it's going to be an impactful death, it's probably going to be Paul, Zenith, or Alina Rize. Whatever concerns Rudy had before were seemingly unwarranted since Paul was actually just half asleep. He had thought the Rudy in front of him was nothing but a dream. Thus, the distant question and answers. Paul would then ask Rudy about his life right there and then, and Rudy would recount everything up until his marriage. The thing about a conversation like that, though, was- Even the... Even the ED arc? <laughs> even the ED I guess my dick wasn't working the entire time. And then, showed up Sophie. Remember that girl that I thought was a boy in season one? Yeah, she saved me. Was that there was a constant fear that Paul would react similarly to last time. 
unless he spoke super objectively and chose his words carefully, Rudy was worried Paul might have another one of his jealousy-driven outbursts. Hiding his happiness turned out to be a bit more difficult than Rudy imagined though since the more he spoke of his time in Renoa, the more I he realized <laughs> he had nothing but good memories there. There were certainly times when things were tough, but as he remembered all that happened with Silphy and everyone else, he truly believed he was having the time of his life there. Yes, and when the tower of cards has been built up, right? Then house of cards has been built up, then it gets fucking just decimated. It's coming, it's coming. So much so that hiding that fact was just impossible. It was once he finished that Rudy was expecting a stern scolding, but instead Paul simply responded with an apology. He truly felt remorse for removing Rudy from his life this way. This definitely came as a surprise since Rudy was sure the implication of him sleeping with someone while Paul couldn't would 100% trigger at least some sort of reaction. Hmm. I mean, Paul did promise to wait until he saved Zenith, so Rudy couldn't even imagine the pain of not doing it for over six years now. Six years celibate. Paul? No nut. Well, you can nut himself, but no girls. No guys. Well, <laughs> I wonder if Paula do some kind of mental gymnastics like, alright, I can't be, you know, clapping cheeks of women anymore, but I will indulge, indulge in femboy bussy until we save Zenith. So he, he has been like, nope, nope, no, no intercourse, no nothing. I will save Zenith. Oh, God. Oh, no. If he dies, he's not going to die a virgin, but he will die <laughs> six years celibate. Oh, no. That's when he found out he did get it on with Lilia once though, but the reason for that was simply because they were attacked by a succubus. I. Okay, so he did still do one. A reasonable excuse since I'm sure you don't need me to describe how depraved a lust-driven Paul would be. Yes, they did have a healer capable of detoxification magic, but, but with Paul acting the way he was, the physical touch necessary to cast such magic would be way too dangerous for her. <laughs> <laughs> implying if the healer tried to touch Paul to heal, Paul would be like, mm. <laughs> he would just jump on her. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Volunteer to take one for the team instead, and that's how the two ended up doing it together. All right, take one now, for the team. That's not to say that was a bad thing, though, since Lilia and Paul are technically officially married, too. You're it's right, just yeah. Paul did promise to wait until he saved Zenith before doing it again. Aside from that, there was a quick mention of Talhunt not being affected by the succubus's poison, and that- No, we can't be having succubuses. We need an incubus, right? No, 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 no. Talhunt is not gonna fall for a succubus. He needs an incubus. Oh my goodness, where are they at? That relates to the reason why he was staring at Rudy's ass later. <laughs> but going back to Paul and Rudy. I want to do more about Talhan. Because that shit came out of fucking nowhere. Because like, we knew about this dwarf. We knew about how he admonishes Irina Rize's activities on the wagon. Remember in season one with Roxy's party? And Irina Rize talking about having like a fucking group like sevensome. And Talhan's like, ugh, hofty woman. But I bet you if he had, a, like, three other Rudys, you know, <laughs> I, I bet you he'd be doing the same shit. Paul would actually comment on how Rudy sounded more confident. It was one of the many signs that he had grown, and that was enough to make him cry even more. Rudy would then embrace Paul himself, and as soon as he realized he no longer had to reach to wrap his arms around him, Aww. that's when Rudy would start crying He's too. all grown. Their years apart had just become so much more apparent to each other. It was after this that Paul would confront Alina Lise, but no context behind their beef was given in the novels either. The whole hmm. matter was resolved so quickly though that Rudy was starting to wonder if it was actually just something very trivial. Now, they didn't really talk about it, but it's heavily hinted about something with Zenith and how they used to have a thing going on and Zenith showed up, but that seems to be the most basic intuitive guess, but it's got to be something more than that, right? Now, to give a bit more context behind the whole Zenith situation, the wording they used to describe it was captured. This was a strange choice since that could imply multiple things, but more than anything, Rudy was confused as to who or what would be holding Zenith captive for- Captured? I thought, so she got teleported in there, she got probably, what is the fucking likelihood of, like, like Zenith literally after the modern disaster got ported into the lowest stratum of this labyrinth? That is, 
gotta be the most unluckiest thing, huh? That's insanely unlucky. Of all the places, you get placed in the lowest level. I'm not sure if it's the lowest level. I'm assuming that it's the lowest stratum of one of the hardest labyrinths to ever exist. That's fucked up. Never realized how dire of a situation Zenith was really in. I thought that because she was also... What is she, like an S-rank adventurer? She's pretty high up, right? That should be fine, but... She's captured. Someone's holding her there. What could this being or monster be? Six long years now. Like, it probably wasn't a person if it was in the depths of the labyrinth, and the notion of it being the labyrinth itself wasn't something Rudy knew was even possible. Monster? Supposedly a party that went in mentioned Bald. someone who resembled Zenith, but that party hasn't been heard from since the last time they went in. They and dead? That was information Geese had acquired almost four years ago. There's no shot that those parties still in there four years later. I'm like thinking about like reinforcements or some other people that we could find in the labyrinth that we could like work together with, but that's an interesting detail. Go. The reason they could still continue searching with the hopes that she was alive now was mostly because of the information that Roxy came with. You see, after hearing from Kashirika that Zenith was alive two years ago, it was more than likely that she was still alive now. Hmm. How does Kishirika know that Zenith is alive? Because of one of her demon eye powers, right? She's got multiple demon eyes. The one that she gave to Rudy was Future Sight, but she's got many different powers, right? She's basically like Kurumi from Data Live, and every different hour or different, you know, fucking eye. Probably has a different power, so one of them must be like, I don't know, prescience? Like, I don't know. She, she, she just knows. If she was able to survive that clairvoyance yeah. between when she went missing and when Kashirika found her, then it's definitely probable she could have gone another two years just fine. This was why Geese was so certain they could still find Zenith, despite him being all doom and gloom for the Roxy situation. Talhunt would then come in shortly after this, and Alina Lise would deliver a warning about how Rudy needed to be careful around Rudius, you better stay away from him. He steal what men hold dear. You gotta keep that protected, my man! Listen! The only thing that should be coming out and going out on the coming out is a dookie, but like, you know, some I, hey, if, 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 if you want to serve some pussy, go ahead. But like, I don't think Rudy rolls that way. And it can tall and get you, you know? He gonna steal what you hold dear, my man. That sphincter, <laughs> the contractile force, the overall <laughs> flexibility. Oh, it's gonna get elongated. Found him. Apparently, he stole what men held most dear. <laughs> of course, Rudy had no idea what she was talking about, but I'm sure you can make your own assumptions based on the detail with the succubus before. <laughs> Any news is too professional to say, you know, Tallhand looking for the bussy, but hey, I'm not as professional as him, so I'll say the quiet part out loud. Now. The news about Roxy was actually more shocking than the news of Zenith since, while Rudy had six years to mentally prepare for Zenith's potential death, there was nothing which helped him to prepare for that scenario with Roxy. It was an abrupt revelation that left One month, him stunned. that's right. Fortunately, he wasn't so naive as to devolve into panic since, while yes he wanted nothing more than to leave right away and go save her, he knew more than anything the most important step right now was careful preparation. Sure, time was definitely of the essence, but to rush into the labyrinth- I do really enjoy Tallhand's beard though, look at this. Look, look at that design, man. Bro, it's got like two separate beards coming down. It is very cool. It's a cool design. Without any plan whatsoever, well, that could very well be the difference between life and death for Roxy. So, it does Rudy look like would a confirm the situation yeah, you're right. as best he could, like then reveal the book which would help them adequately prepare. I had talked about this back in episode 5, so I'll include that segment about the book's con- Right, this is like the, one of the most important books that we found at the school, which talks about the labyrinth teleportation, but who knew that it would be this one, bro? Contents now, just in case you forgot about it. The book was a creative non-fiction that told the tale of Animus' exploration of the teleportation labyrinth. With the labyrinth housing traps only related to teleportation, the actual traversal of it became rather difficult. It was from what Animus and his companions could find that they were able to narrow the traps down into three broad categories. The first was a one-way teleporter that sent people to the same fixed location, the second a reciprocal teleporter that led to a magic circle allowing for teleportation back, 
Then the third a random teleporter, which well That's a dangerous one. Anyway. That's what Roxy's All was. All of right? which had a good chance to send you straight to a pack of monsters, since the creatures inhabiting this labyrinth were both intelligent and cunning. Not only did they understand the labyrinth's complex layout, but they also knew where every teleporter would send someone. What the Often waiting at the destination to hunt whoever it was that was using them. Damn, that's scary. These monsters are highly organized. This is not random traversal through teleportations. When they were getting summoned in, they were all going for Roxy. That was all intentional. I'm like, where the fuck are these dudes coming from? They just keep spawning. But damn, they just know. They're way too smart. We need to nuke this place. In any case, it was after Animus had found a way to determine which teleporters were reciprocal and which were not that he would only use reciprocals to bring himself deeper. The plan itself was working rather fine, but it was a single misstep that would cause him to use a random one by accident. A fatal mistake that would cause him to lose his entire party and one of his arms. Damn. Fortunately, he survived, but with no way to I love all the different isekai, you know, pictures that he's bringing in to uh, work as imagery for his descriptions. Now we have like Adi Furita. I'm not sure what this one was before. I would love it if he brought in, you know, um, so I'm a spider, so what uh, isekai for the labyrinth stuff too, but okay. Find himself in the labyrinth anymore, he decided to leave the conquering of it to the reader. Thus the reason he had written this book. Now, it was possible this book pertained to a completely different teleportation labyrinth, so naturally it was best to evaluate whether that was true or not. If you're wondering why Geese was the person to do that, well, Rudy wasn't quite sure himself, but it was clear by everyone's reactions that he was the person responsible for this type of stuff. Okay. He seemed to be this flex-type member responsible for everything that wasn't battle. Like handyman, just utility support, the glue that holds the team together, not a fighter, but everything else he'll maintain that it's very useful. This included anything from mapping and directions, all the way to managing supplies, choosing what drops to take, and even how to extract them. Unsung hero he of the was party. Both the commander and the errand boy. The group's manager, planner, and coordinator. He would even be the one to decide whether it was best to retreat or not. So, given that this was his role, Straight up, the shot caller of the group. Straight up. He is like the leader of the pack. It made sense that he would be the one to sift through the book's information like that. It was while he did that Rudy would ask Paul four key questions about the labyrinth. What were the monsters? How many Spiders. floors were there? What was the interior like? And what were the shape of the teleportation circles? The monsters were divided into five main types, and these were giant poisonous tarantulas capable of Spiders? projectiles, tank-like caterpillars with sturdy defenses, human-shaped mud a rank. Uh -oh. enough to cast magic, armored warriors. Whoa! These dudes can cast magic. Human? They're smart. What the fuck? Enough to cast magic. Armored warriors similar to armored these guys warriors? from Elden Ring, and the devouring devil, which was a beast with long limbs and knife-like claws and fangs. Devouring Devil. I don't think we've seen them just yet, but the Mud Beast, you know, that's smart enough to cast magic on this guy is pretty scary. Limbs and knife-like claws and fangs. There was an unknown number of floors leading to the bottom, but the most reliable rumor was that it was something like six or seven. Of course, since no one had actually reached the bottom, the Labyrinth's Guardian was just as much of a mystery. So, last episode they mentioned the six stratum, but that's as far as they've gotten before or something right? So no one has ever gotten to the bottom, so it's either six or seven? It was just as much of a mystery as the depths itself. They did, however, know what enemy- We don't even know the guardian of the- like, like, straight up, all these monsters are fodder. They're random trash. But there's a guardian of the labyrinth, which is most likely holding Zenith captive, right? Why, if that's the case, why would the Guardian of the Labyrinth hold Zenith captive instead of just killing her? What incentives do they have to keep Zenith alive, you know? What kind of use is Zenith right now? Is she being used as a battery? Is she being treated as literally like a slave? Like, I, I don't know. Enemies to expect on each floor since the deeper you went, the more dangerous they got. So, floor one was only spiders. Floor two, both spiders and caterpillars. Floor 3, the mud skulls which oh exhibited God. command over the monsters before. Floor 4, only mud skulls and armored warriors. And then the floor devil. Floor 5, only armored warriors and devouring devils. Then floor 6, devouring devils alone. And, okay, okay, okay. The reason the labyrinth follows this type of hierarchy is because the first three floors were part of those ant nests I had mentioned it's earlier. It's all leveling. Floor 4 and below were ancient ruins that somehow became connected to it. What? 
ancient ruins more lore so the ants that mutated by eating the behemoth stuff and other monster things were able to create tunnels and stuff like that and that's what started the labyrinth but four and below it's straight up a ruins ancient ruins civilizations of the past that existed that connects to the labyrinth by luck what is going on here what is the lore of this place so whereas the initial floors are complex winding pathways with rooms connected to them the later floors were more of what you'd expect from a dungeon clear paths and hallways with larger rooms branching off from them now the teleporter shape was no different from the one Rudy knew himself, so that only provided confirmation for what Rudy already suspected. It was once that confirmation was made that a proper formation would then be decided upon. Alina Lise would be the party's She's tank, the tank. All the secondary DPS. I guess she is frontline warrior, has a buckle shield, but Alina Lise tank is funny to me. I feel like Talhan should be tank. It's alongside Talhan. Talhan's secondary DPS sent the it. occasional off tank, then Rudy the primary DPS and primary healer. These four would be in charge. Primary of DPS and primary healer is crazy. <laughs> How the fuck you doing both at once? Wait, what about that other girl that was supposed to heal Paul but couldn't because Paul would fucking, you know, plunge at her? What about her? Of combat and Geese would handle everything else. Talhan's role was a bit more vague than everyone else's though, since while he was an all-purpose fighter capable of close quarters combat, yeah. he was also a magician capable of intermediate tier earth magic. Oh, okay, magician that too. Being the case, his position was one in which he could always do both. He would hover around Rudy and cast magic if need be, or step up to the front and join the fight as well. He's been just standing behind Rudy the entire time, looking at his bussy, bro. He's just been like, mm, that ass. Oh yeah. I'm and like, the thing about him is, he's also short, right? Because he's a dwarf. So it's like perfect height for like Rudy. Bro's got this thing, entire thing fucking figured out, man. It really just depended on what the circumstances called for. As for Lilia, Viera, and Shiera, they their stayed job home? was to simply house it. Okay. Since Rudy and Alina Lise were the replacements for them, they were now tasked with making sure the group had somewhere to come back to. An important job that pretty much every large clan had someone do. The preparations were then done mostly by Alina Lise or Talhand, but if there was ever a time where Rudy felt his knowledge would be helpful, he figured he would only mention it as a suggestion. Perhaps his experience playing roguelike RPGs could actually be useful, but Maybe. considering the others were all real-life veterans, Rudy figured it was best to leave everything to them. So, the plan as of now was to get to the third floor and rescue Roxy, then, and then retreat the immediately the after drips. and see if she was good enough to regroup and go save Zenith. It was a fairly straightforward set of objectives that Rudy assumed would become long and complicated. He honestly had no idea how long any of this would actually take. This brings us now to his conversations at night, and aside from Lilia asking about Aisha and Paul talking about his proclivities, hmm. there was an interesting cutscene involving Rudy thinking about the man god. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He was lying in bed trying to concentrate, and it was as he did that he wondered if this was what the man god wanted all along. Man God played reverse psychology for Rudy to definitely take action? Huh. That's a very interesting thought. This was so important for the Man God's overall narrative, his script, his plans, for Rudy to go and save Zenith. This is something that he lied to to kind of make Rudy go there. Hmm. The fuck? The fuck? Okay, well, I'm kind of at a loss of... Well, at the end of the day, right, my still theory is, you know, the whole Orsted hates Man God is because Orsted seems to be some kind of police, some kind of keeper of time and different threads of history and timelines, because he already knew about, like, oh, Paul shouldn't have a child, Eris, you're already this strong, blah, 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 right? And then the Man God acts with Rudy. Man God uses Rudy, who is an Isekai character, an outlier, someone that shouldn't be part of this world, that's impacting, obviously, the... Uh, trajectory of the timelines. Therefore, Orsted hates the Man God and considers Rudy an apostle of the Man God. But Man God's ultimate goal is. I don't know that part. What does he truly want at the end of all this? Something about, you know, human supremacy? Because he's a man? I don't know. I mean, had he not told Rudy to go to Renoa and study teleportation, then he wouldn't have found this book which would conveniently turn That's out so true. to be so helpful and That's so true. 
it was clear the man god's words always hid some sort of deeper meaning and his even from the beginning of the mana disaster of zenith getting sent to the fucking labyrinth of the teleporter that was all within expectations of the man god because the whole point was for rudy to eventually make it there holy shit this is blowing my mind what's his goal after though what after if we get to save zenith potentially it can't be just like i doubt man god's plans involve rudy saving his parents or maybe them dying like what kind of impact would that have on a greater scale in the world i feel like that is so trivial but rudy doing this is gonna trigger some catastrophic set of events to Enable man god's plans? I don't know. The last conversation was certainly no exception to that. This brought into question why the man god would suggest the ridiculous things that- My guess still about the mana disaster is Rudy. Uh, 100% Rudy, um, was the- Like, he gets compared to demon god Laplace's mana pool. Only person with that big of a mana. What was causing the mana disaster? This, uh, f this, um, accumulation of mana that, you know, appear in the sky over time. When did that happen? As soon as Rudy arrived at that place and stayed in town with Eris and it started to accumulate subconsciously and then there was some kind of detonation part? 100% Man God wanted that to happen. So Rudy is definitely the catalyst and Man God... I don't know. I don't know what the detonation was. Uh, it was. It was strange how Rudy, you know, tried to cast a spell with this new wand or new staff that he was gifted from the family, right? And then at that point, that's when the fucking mana disaster happened. There was also... Uh, Lord Perugius and his knight that showed up, and I think the knight also was teleporting and shit, but... I still think Rudy is definitely a core part of the Mana Disaster. ...that he did, and the only answer Rudy could come up with was that he was purposefully trying to agitate him. It was as if the man-god knew Rudy was trying to be rebellious, and as a way to counter that, he did a bit of reverse psychology. Okay. This was confirmed by Rudy saying he would have done the opposite regardless of what the man god said. So, had he told him to go to Begarit and leave Sylphie instead, All according then to he 100% plan. would have stayed behind and sent someone else. So, now that the man god had shown yet again his work. I don't think Nanahoshi said that. I think Nanahoshi said something about uh, displacement theory, about how, like, if you look at the space time continuum and of, like, you know, Rudy was reincarnated, but Nanahoshi was teleported, therefore, equal equivalence exchange. If you, you know, drop a, a like, you're basically dropping, like, a bucket of water, a drop of, I don't know, a bucket of water into this bucket, and then it somehow has to shift, and that's the modern disaster. I, I, I think there is that theory too, right? Yeah. I still think that. Rudy was the main part, though. Even if Nanahoshi is part of it, no one knows. There's no confirmation. Nanahoshi, what she said, was also just a assumption, wasn't it? Also, hold the fuck up. I feel like we're, tr we're forgetting a really important thing. Uh, what did Nanahoshi say about the mechanics of this world and how it's just trying to kill you? If we try to do something... Uh, uh, yeah, the build-up was Rudy, but trigger was Nanahoshi. I could definitely agree with that. But uh, wh what was that fucking... What did she say? about the rules of the world and how isekai characters need to be very fucking careful because the more you try to disrupt the world or the natural flow of something, the more the world will try to delete you like a virus, like an immune system. Did she make that comparison in part one of season two? There was a really, really, f time will erase them. That's what she said. History is trying to correct itself. Time, time will erase them. What the fuck? I don't know. This is getting too big brain for me. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just here to fucking laugh and fucking yell bald. Words were to Rudy's benefit. It made Rudy think that perhaps the man god just truly enjoyed watching him. He had no clue what was going on in his head, but considering how at every step he's always been incredibly helpful, Rudy maybe the man god's just super bored. There is no grandiose plan. There is no crazy narrative or script. Man God's bored as fuck, he's got nothing to do, realize, oh, hey, shit, there's a new Isekai character here. I'm gonna play around with him, he's gonna be my player, and then I'm gonna, like, you know, tell him to do this shit and manage him, and he's gonna do whatever I want, it's gonna be fun like that. I, I could totally see that too, yeah? Rudy could no longer deny the fact that he was genuinely an ally to him. He did, after all, send him to the one place that had everything he needed to save Zenith. But, that just happens to be a coincidence. I don't think Man God is an enemy or an ally. He's just doing whatever the fuck he wants, and the things that he told us to do sometimes have definitely paid off, and it looks like he's being helpful, but that's still... I don't know. This guy's sus. I do not trust him. 
Fast forward now to the day of the rescue, and Rudy's spirit scrolls would turn out to be far more useful than you may think. Not only did it mean that Paul and Geese didn't have to carry torches, but the light was brighter and lasted longer. Even if the user had summoned it a fraction of the mana that Rudy did, it would still more than likely last the length of an expedition. More than anything, freeing up a hand was invaluable, so these lamplight <sighs> scrolls could very well put torches out of the market if Rudy wanted to. Oh. So, Geese had one to himself to could become steps billionaires. Ahead of the group, while the other hovered by Alina Lise and Paul as they followed behind. The special shoe he wore made identifying his footsteps easier, and oh. the general rule was to follow them precisely. That's what- okay. Now, the first floor was, as I said, tarantulas, and their innate knowledge of the labyrinth inadvertently identified where traps were. We saw this in this scene here, since the way they avoided it indicated it was a trap. Rookie adventurers would see it as a way to avoid stepping on the spiders, but in actuality, it was a one-way ticket to get You dum-dums! Paul would typically be the one to dispatch these spiders, and the weapons he used were both familiar and unfamiliar. His main hand carried the sword he trained with all the time back in Fedora, while blade, his offhand was a sword too long to be called short and too short to be called long. Medium blade. It was a completely different Mid type blade. of weapon that Rudy had never seen before. Paul wasn't really using it much to fight at all though, so Rudy wondered if it was just there to look cool or something. <laughs> now. Daddy is so cool today. Is, that, is he just trying to flex? That's it? He just had that just to flex? Alina Lise's reveal about Paul being her son was actually something that got way more of a reaction from him. The moment he heard that she was now fam- Yeah, she is family, right? Because, like, Rudy is Paul's son, but, you know, Paul's daughter-in-law's grandmother is Alina Lise, therefore, mother-in-law. Family, he immediately broke formation, went to Rudy, and verified it. The news of Laws being her son came as quite the shock to him. All that stuff aside though, it took five hours and five teleporters to get down to the second floor. Each teleporter led to a path to another teleporter, and the time it took to get between them was about one hour. Occasionally there'd be two teleporters side by side, but Geese had marked the right ones beforehand. The second floor brought with it a new enemy, and these iron crawlers worked together with the spiders. The spiders would immobilize their targets from a distance, then iron crawlers would trample them using their one-ton bodies and heavy defenses. One ton? They weren't so tough these that- These caterpillars are heavy! Them, but unlike the spiders, these iron crawlers weren't an enemy Paul could one-shot anymore. They're actually the reason why they couldn't make it very far without Roxy on their team. The iron crawlers were just an extremely bad matchup for them. Now that Rudy was here, things were a whole lot easier, so not only was this their easiest expedition yet, but Tallhand even found himself bored since there wasn't anything for him to do anymore. Motherfucker wasn't bored, he was focusing on Rudy's gut the entire time, just steadily, just walking behind, bro. Nah, 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 Tallhand was fully locked in the entire episode. He was literally on stage. Nah, 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 you see the eyes right here? Nah. This motherfucker right here, you think he's looking above. No, his peripheral vision is going down right now. Don't get fooled, guys. Tall Hand is not looking ahead right now. The peripheral vision is locked the fuck in. Stand by while Rudy cleaned up everything. This would lead to him becoming the lookout while everyone was on. Oh, break, he's looking out for sure. On break that Geese would talk with Rudy. He wanted to know, based on the rough maps he put together, where Rudy's intuition might think Roxy was. The map showed where they'd been and where they've searched before, so it was based on that that Rudy would point to an empty spot east of where they were. A brand new area yet to be searched that Rudy honestly just picked at random. It was a good distance away from the trap that had teleported her, so it seemed like a good place to start rather than searching everywhere. So this is all intuition? I thought there was something about the water dripping? Rudy smelling? Now he doesn't have Tanjiro's fucking nose, this ain't Demon Slayer, how do you know? That's when the group would head to floor Just three, luck? and almost immediately after entering, he would smell something familiar. It was a presence he would never mistake for anything else, and 100% proof that Roxy was close. Well, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. What, what did you just say? Immediately after entering, he would smell something familiar. Smell! So he smelled Roxy's piss. She, he smelled Roxy's one month unshowered, fully seasoned... <laughs> He smelled that dank dank. It was a presence he would never mistake for anything else and 100% okay. proof that Roxy was close. That's when the novel switches over to Roxy's perspective and it actually explains how it is she survived <laughs> yeah. so long. 
I do believe that's something we'll get at the beginning of next episode though, so right here is a pretty good place to stop. Alright, and I just wish maybe it would ruin this moment, this reunion of Roxy and Rudy. Master and Apprentice a long time ago, but now that a lot of time has passed, almost resembling the ideal man, the way that she wants to be saved. You know, in a labyrinth, almost dead, and this guy shows up, right? Now, if only he had the sacred relic at that same time, a fresh pair of panties to give her. Oh, that would have been perfect, but no, that would have kind of ruined the moment, right? We're trying to be serious right now. My degenerate brain, my content brain is just trying to figure out what kind of jokes I could be making. But that's it for today's episode of Any News. Guys, please go give Mr. Any News a sub. Like his video if you did. You always give such good, great breakdowns of the things that were missed from, you know, the last episode. And yeah, this whole labyrinth, I didn't understand just exactly how dangerous it would be. S rank labyrinth, a teleportation labyrinth. And that Roxy was gone for an entire month. That shit was like, holy shit. Is it just not her parents gonna die, but Roxy too? But no, we saved Roxy and I think Roxy is gonna be fine. With Roxy addition to our team, her power is gonna be even better. Expedition should be better. But again, I fully expect someone to die. And we'll cross that bridge when we get there.